Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from me as well. I'm Guillem Martinez Roura the, from the International Telecommunication Union, and I would like to welcome you all for joining today's AI for Good webinar on robots for the SDGs, leveraging AI power robotics for good, organized by the ITU. Today's special session marks one year since the launch of the AI for Good robotics programming track, exploring how AI power robots are helping to unlock our human potential and advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we are counting on you, the participants, to help create a very interactive session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator today. Her name is LJ Rick, and she's the BBC Click presenter. LJ, welcome, and the show is all yours. Thank you so much, Guillaume, for inviting me and welcome everyone to the launch of the new series of robotics coverage for the next year. Yes, the AI and robotics track of the AI for Good Summit has quickly become a fan favourite and I'm very excited to host today's Robots for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, leveraging AI-powered robotics for good. And we have around 350 people from all over the world joining us. Thanks so much for coming. As Guillaume said, I'm LJ Rich, AI music artist artist and BBC TV presenter and as always it's a pleasure to host you audience and panelists. Robots are becoming more sophisticated, more autonomous and more versatile. So you can imagine pairing robots with AI helps machines learn and even adapt in real time to changing environments. If you're like me, you may have read quite a lot of science fiction. A main staple of most stories involve robot helpers, from Marvin the paranoid android of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to HAL in 2001, not to mention androids like Star Trek's Data, um, C-3PO, even the Orville's Isaac. But back to reality, how do we make robots for good? And how can we do this while advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Well, it's more than robot surgery or remote search and rescue. Robots performing tasks alongside humans as peers, a blended AI-human approach. It might help people with mobility, cognitive impairments, things like that, navigate the world better. And remote explorations in complex environments like the bottom of the ocean or even in the vacuum of space become possible. And our panel will be anything but a vacuum if the rehearsal is anything to go by. Talking of which, I'm going to let them briefly turn their cameras on as we say hello to Henny Admoni, Dev Singh, Anthony Jules and Maya Mataric. Hello there, you lot. Here's a little round of applause for you. <laughs> I'm going to invite each speaker for opening remarks in turn. This can be a presentation or a little mini interview with me, and then we'll start opening up for questions for the whole panel. Audience, you are welcome to submit questions. The best ones will be read out live. And once our panel ends, we're all staying on the neural network, which is lots of fun. It's where audiences and panelists mix randomly with the help of AI, and we chat with each other over a special messaging system. This only lasts for about 15 minutes, so enjoy it while you can, and we might get matched by our interests to someone we have something in common with, an audience member, a panellist, even me. So we're all staying on for that and we'll see you soon. And with that rather exciting agenda in mind, I'm going to ask our later panellists to turn off their cameras and mute as we welcome our very first one, who is the A. Nico Haberman Assistant Professor Robotics, Robotics Institute, Carnegie Mellon University. Yes, everybody, it's Henny Admoni. <laughs> 
Thank you, LJ. What a fantastic introduction. I, I need to record that so that I can just play it when I enter rooms. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I uh, would like to talk to you today about what it means to build AI and robotics for social good and why I think it's so important that we are able to pay attention to the human side of AI so that we can build better AI collaboration. So um, I want you all to imagine your favorite robot. LJ actually set me up perfectly for this. Uh, we didn't coordinate this at all, but you know, imagine your favorite robot from media or from stories. And you might've come up with some of the robots that are on this slide. We can imagine uh, robots that are helpful, that can understand our language and live in our environments and perform tasks in collaboration with us. So this is not a, uh, this reality is not an issue of imagination. Media has been uh, giving us these robots for a very long time. But the reality of robotics out in commercial enterprise today looks a lot more like this. Um, these are robots that are constructing um, cars in a BMW factory. And they're amazing robots, don't get me wrong. The autonomy and the precision that they're capable of is really kind of impressive. But what you should notice about this scene is that there are no people. And in fact, people are specifically prohibited from being in this environment because the, um, the robots can be quite dangerous. And so um, the, uh, the question that I try to solve is, why do we have this gap, right? Why can we imagine robots that are so helpful and um, integrated into our society and collaborative, and yet we haven't gotten there yet? And my, uh, my whole research agenda tries to close that gap. And one of the things that I think is critical for that is understanding the human side of this equation. What it is about people that can help our robots become more collaborative. Um, so I, uh, I have two, so the goal of the work that I do, like I said, is to build these intelligent robots and AI that are able to not just respond to people, but actually provide collaborative assistance. And the reason I think this is possible in the future is because we know a lot about how people work. Um, and if we can leverage that information about human beings for, uh, to enable our robots to understand things like what kind of goal somebody has, what kind of help they need, or what the context of the situation is, we can make our robots more intelligent and more capable of collaboration. So let me walk you through a couple of different examples of the kinds of work that I think about in terms of AI. Um, I work in a variety of different domains, and so this is where I'm coming from. Uh, the other speakers will sh uh, talk to you surely about other complementary domains as well. Um, the robots that I think about and the AI that I think about um, function most often in physically and socially assistive contexts. These are robots for, or AI for things like helping older adults manage medication at home, or um, helping people with severe upper motor impairment operate a robot arm to accomplish activities of daily living. If you're going to build AI to work with people, you also need that AI to be explainable and transparent so that the people who are using it can understand when it's capable of doing something, when it's not, um, and so that they can accurately trust the system as appropriate. Um, lately, we've also been getting into domains like autonomous vehicles, and learning from human decision-making, and I'll talk about each of those too. So just a whirlwind uh, number of examples with some insights about why people are so important in this equation. Um, the first one I wanna talk to you about is this assistive teleoperation context where uh, we have robots that are helpful for people with severe upper motor impairment. Um, these are commercial systems that you can purchase this particular robot is made by uh, Kinova Robotics in Canada. And these are systems that enable people to manipulate the world, um, move objects around uh, with a robot if they aren't able to do it by themselves. What we've seen in my research is that we can actually use AI to make these teleoperated robots somewhat autonomous through shared control by predicting the goals that people have. And the way we predict those goals is through eye gaze. Um, and also through the joystick movements that people are using to control the robot. So if we pay attention to what the human is doing in the course of this interaction, we can actually build shared autonomy systems 
that are better capable of assisting people by predicting their goals. We've used the same principle moving into the assistive driving space. So in this case, um, you're seeing a video of a driving simulator that we've developed in my lab. And the um, great thing about this simulator, which is in VR, is that we can replicate a very realistic driving environment and track people's eyes as they're moving through this environment. So you can see the um, small circle that indicates where people are attending. And now uh, what we're working on currently is building models of attention. So monitoring where people are looking, using that to build up a uh, list of information they know about, for example, obstacles or other cars, and then enabling the uh, AI to assist them toward um, either uh, alerting them to uh, obstacles they haven't seen or even taking some kind of assistive action like predictive braking. Um, and so we're very interested in how we can link people's behavior in a car to the kinds of assistive technologies that a car is capable of. Um, one of the most important parts of AI is this ability for AI systems to learn. So uh, I'm talking about machine learning now because you can't talk about AI these days without getting to machine learning. Um, machine learning allows our systems to develop and adapt beyond what they were initially capable of and also to personalize to individual users, which is very important. Um, what I am most fascinated by is the way that people actually teach each other. So people teach each other in different ways than our traditional machine learning algorithms expect to be taught. And if you can create machine learning algorithms that learn the way people do, that is through the different kinds of feedback that people provide, you can make the teaching interaction more natural and make people better at actually providing this kind of machine learning feedback to AI systems. Um, and so when I talk about the kinds of interactions that people use to teach, I mean things like, um, if I were to teach you to throw a baseball, maybe first I would demonstrate how to throw a baseball to you, but then I might have you throw a baseball and tell you that was very good, or you should keep your elbow lower, or this one was better than the last time you tried to throw a baseball. So all of these different modalities, all these different interaction types can all come together to enable uh, better learning from an AI system. There we go. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that humans are not static creatures. So when we think about AI for good, we also really need to consider the fact that people will be mutually adapting to the AI system. If the AI system is learning from them, people are gonna be learning just as much from the system. We've seen it, for example, with um, cell phones, right? Typing on cell phones has become a very natural modality, maybe some people will say it's not so natural, um, a modality to communicate or using a keyboard or using a mouse. Um, these are ways that people have adapted to technology. And as AI becomes more pervasive, we'll also see people adapting to that, which means that we need to be ready to change our AI systems and have our AI systems take advantage of that mutual adaptation while avoiding leading people to adaptations that are harmful to them, like um, keeping them out of the loop of the tasks that they want to do. Um, so I will end there. Uh, I just want, if you take nothing else out of this talk, I want you to remember this one key concept, which is that um, we can build better AI for social good if the AI can understand how human behaviors can inform it about the context, needs, and goals that people have in human AI collaboration. And with that, I will pass it back to LJ. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me just turn my video back on. There we go. There we go. Oh, nice and smooth. Henny, what a fantastic start to our anniversary session. A brilliant roundup of the current issues facing designing robots for humans for good. So I can't wait to have you back in as we open up the panel. So next up then, let's have a deeper dive into the world of autonomous systems with the GM of robotics, UAVs and autonomous systems. Again, it's Qualcomm, it's Dev Singh. <laughs> Thank you so much, LJ. So I'm Dev Singh. I lead the robotics, drones, and intelligent machine business at Qualcomm. 
for those who don't know Qualcomm, Qualcomm is a leading technology company that has defined mobile experience, is redefining computing, and now transforming industries, uh, be it agriculture, be it manufacturing. We, uh, you would see our technologies touch every aspect of lives. You would have them something in your hands, robots in your homes, two robots on Mars. We, our uh, chip and technology is in the Ingenuity helicopter that's on the Mars as well. So with that, I'll just get started uh, in talking about, if I can have my next slide. Okay, yeah. So before I get started, like, um, I want to take a few minutes on how we think about AI is evolving with the technology that we are creating on a daily basis. We spend over $5 billion in R&D year on year, close to. Uh, since our inception, 30 years plus, we have spent $75 billion on R&D. And what that has done, specifically in terms of at least AI, uh, is moving the charter along with the experiences that AI was before to what it is going to be and what it is in transition to be. So to begin with, AI was a very narrow, narrow topic and it was a research topic. Now it's becoming more generalized. It's touching every aspect of our life. And then as Henny also uh, touched upon a little bit, collaborative, right? Before it was the learning of AI was more manual, but now with the, with the adoption of technology, which we'll cover a little bit more about uh, 5G and others that enhance the experience, it's going from being mobile uh, manual to be more adaptive. Think about swarm drones, federated learning, all of that is happening in real time and is adaptive. So it's continu continuously adapting to the new information. And one other key point that uh, if you remember AI it was always um, associated with the central cloud, some remote uh, server farm doing all the uh, AI and intelligence, but now with the technology that is being put in uh, at the edge or on the devices that we enable, it is becoming a more distributed compute. And this has a lot of significance in terms of the processing being where it is needed, that has implications on the environmental aspects of things, implications on energy consumption and few others. And this is actually our vision of distributed intelligent compute that is going, that is the future and that's in, in evolution right now. And that is happening because of technologies like 5G coming in aid with AI. So now we are seeing billions of devices that are connected, massive amounts of data is being transferred. So for AI, the fundamental oil that our AI runs on is data and 5G helps moving that data seamlessly between devices to cloud to edge. That is why the tandem of these powerful technologies by themselves, they're really powerful, but the real magic happens when we combine these technologies and that's why it is very unique uh, at Qualcomm is uh, the capabilities of uh, our AI being more energy efficient instead of being cloud centric with AI training and influencing in central cloud, you can move it to the partial distributed AI providing more power efficiency and reliability as well. Um, and there are multiple reasons why, especially in terms of robotics, AI intelligence is paramount on the device, specifically because robots are used for a lot of real-time applications. You want a drone flying or a robot doing its thing, be autonomous, intelligent as much as possible and be able to collaborate as well. So for reasons like uh, latency, privacy, late, uh, reliability, you need a lot of AI on the edge but the key is the AI on the edge needs to be power efficient. And that's where um, our differentiation and the technology that is being created is aiding that. And this is the future. Uh, you would have robots that are very powerful by themselves in terms of processing power with uh, real-time AI. 
But again, to be cognizant, these are battery operated devices. These have challenges in terms of form factors. So you can only do so much processing, but that is enough for doing the critical real-time application. But because the 5G acts as this uh, information highway or a pipeline seamlessly connecting the robot brain to the central cloud as and when needed, it can tap into the central cloud and with the edge private networks, you can do distributed learning and swarm operations as well. So that's how we are seeing the evolution of our technologies like AI and 5G aiding uh, each other. And this is more and more impacting every aspects of life, like we said. I mean, there are a few examples here. Of course, uh, uh, any test on, on the mobile experience, how we are adapting, how the AI is helping giving more information that we need. But more importantly, uh, based on the UN sustainable goals, some of them, if you touch upon that, goal number nine is about industrial innovation um, and infrastructure. Uh, goal number 11 is about sustainable smart cities and communities. Those are being uh, done because of the powers of this technology that's being put behind it. The 5G aspect of things, the real time, camera uh, real-time, AI real-time, machine learning is helping all those sustainability goals. Um, and when it comes specifically to robots, the technology is not only addressing one use case, but multiple use cases. We talked about uh, factories, uh, BMW factory, for example. But when you talk about logistics, warehouses, when you talk about delivery, the carbon footprint that is being impacted by moving to uh, more uh, EV driven vehicles, which are autonomous to drone delivery that is being talked about. The significance of that is going to be Im impactful. Example of agriculture is also very important, which I can cover in the next slide as well. Retail, public safety, all of these are being touched with the AI robotics and the sky is the limit and uh, how things are being done. Some examples, again, drones is a big passion of mine and there are multiple use cases that, uh, uh, that are being enabled because of the powers of AI and 5G. Drones are flying cameras, but think about a use case like agriculture. There are sustainable goals of redu reducing use of fertilizers. And how can that be done? That can be done only through precision agriculture. And how does precision agriculture happen? It happens because of this IoT sensors in the field uh, connected to each other with the technology and with drones being uh, able to scout, map, identify defects, which share uh, information of those defects and maps with the robots that can go and spray specifically where uh, the spraying of a fertilizer or a pesticide is needed as opposed to spraying across the field. So that again aids in terms of use of pesticide and um, helping nature and mother earth by reducing the reliance of pesticides and fertilizers. So those are some examples that not how we can do, how we are already doing uh, uh, with use of AI and 5G and aiding these use cases. I can go on and on inspection of uh, critical infrastructure, specifically in uh, wind turbines uh, that I'll cover a little bit. Public safety, delivery, like we talked about, there's a lot of uh, reduction in um, carbon footprint. But one tangible example or anecdote that, again, like I mentioned, it's not about the future, it's about now, and it is already being done. So, um, um, Vayu is one of our partners and we are working with them in terms of how the energy utility companies can use AI and 5G. And this is a good anecdote. If you take a wind turbine, wind farm, you can see rows of wind turbines um, in, in, in the uh, farm. But what happens is something that you don't know is, uh, maybe you know also is wake. There's a wake uh, problem that reduces the efficiency of these wind turbines. What happens is the first row of wind turbines take the impact of the wind and they're rotating, of course, they 
disperse the wind. So the efficiency or the wind that reaches the next in the rows is minimum uh, to uh, not as efficient production of energy. But now with AI and drones in the air, uh, monitoring the wind directions, doing the uh, doing things like uh, digital twins, being able to give enough insights of with on device uh, uh, on device AI and also being able to share this information real time. There has been already the study we've done, or actually this is deployed has created a max lot of impact when we are repowering the wind turbines we are able to understand that because you are able to manage the yaw pitch of each of this wind wind turbine you are able to maximize the wind energy but at the same time provide enough for the others so with that you are able to now have more wind turbines because these are intelligently adapting themselves you are able to get more uh, output from the wind turbine, at least 30% increase in space between turbines, uh, doubling the energy production, increasing the wind term turbine capacity. And all this is mind boggling. At the same time, all this is very impactful because this is how we are going to um, be able to create sustainable energy. Reliance on fossil fuels will be reduced. And this is just an anecdote, the, it's just the beginning of all of this. So with this, I'll leave here. And as we talk uh, more and more, we can go into other use cases as well. So thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks for listening. Dev, brilliant. Thank you so much for some deeply human insights into collaborating with machines. And lucky for us, we have a real world scenario primed and ready to talk about with the CEO and co-founder of Robust AI. It's Anthony Jules. Hello there, Anthony. You get a round of applause. Even though I've been staying here, um, I'm going to do a little fireside chat with you next. So thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, tell us a little more about some of Robust AI's concepts. So at Robust AI, we've combined you know, AI, robotics, and human-centered design to invent a new class of robot that we call Carter, a little bit of a play on words. Carter is capable of being completely autonomous, but you know, with the touch of its handle, it turns into a power tool that lets people move hundreds of pounds effortlessly. Um, but Carter is designed really from the ground up to collaborate with people doing tasks where people and robots interleave the work that they're doing. You know, this looks and should feel simple, but it takes an incredible amount of sophisticated AI and software. And for us, it's important because this is the future we want to build because it's the future that we want to live in. Um, and that's really a, a core tenet of what we care about as a company. It's um, really inventing this future that we all want to be a part of. It does feel like we're moving to a future where robots are less autonomous and more collaborative. So let's talk a little bit about humans and robots working together, which is a direct contrast, I think, to the old trope of robots taking over. Yeah, so I think, you know, there's certainly places where full autonomy makes sense. But um, there's actually a larger um, you know, set of tasks and set of things we do where interacting with people is core to doing the job well. You know, and if we, we strip that interactivity, um, out of those experiences and it's things like you know any interaction that you have in retail or any restaurant or even in your home we don't want to pull human interaction out of those experiences we actually want to let people do what people do best which is interacting with others and you know parsing context and emotional information and my perspective is let the robots do the rest of it you know, that robots should be great at the grunge work and we should spend our time becoming better at people and interacting with each other um, and, and pull out the menial and tedious work. I get that. And we saw in the video that robots seem to know where they're going. And in some case, I believe they're able to predict the movement of the humans. So I'd love to know more about the software environment that enables this. Yeah. So one of the things that we really strive for in Carter and in that video that you saw is making things feel uh, normal to people 
So for example, for everything in our lives, we are accustomed to just going over and grabbing it if we want it to be somewhere else. Um, you know, like you walk up to a table, you move the chair you're gonna sit in and you sit in it. We don't even think about this. This is actually not something you can do with any, any robots in the world right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even when they're not behind a fence, they're behind a virtual fence. Um, so one example of what we did is make, just make that natural. Um, but to make the interaction natural and to get um, you know, tasks where you can interleave what you're doing, we actually need to know where people are and what they're doing. So in a privacy preserving way, we actually know that you're near the robot. We know when you reach your hand out and you're grabbing the robot. Um, and it's important to use all of that Design sensing. and deploy user-friendly automation oh, for your company in a day. With Grace. I think we can just, oh, we well, might run that without the sound so that you can keep talking if that's all right. Okay, because sure. Because there's some really yep. interesting stuff around how you map the environment, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Because it's not as simple as you think because people are moving. So you need to recognize what things are moving, what things aren't, which bits are for loading, which bits are, are people so um, yes, please tell me a bit more about how you go about doing that. Sure, so one of the things we've done to make this simple to use is um, instead of running the robot around to make a map, we actually allow someone to make a map just by using a phone or a tablet. And um, if you can run the video, we then produce a, an actual digital, uh, essentially a digital twin of the environment. But because our software and AI knows the difference between static objects like shelves and walls, et cetera, we actually create an understanding of the world that allows us to do high level planning of where the robots can go and how they should go, but also allows us to do really easy interactions like, you know, you see um, my colleague here making what we call a virtual conveyor belt. She just selected five locations and said, okay, robots show up. One of you shows up at each location every minute and move stuff around. Um, and being able to, you know, making things like this digital twin um, by understanding things in the environment like people and pallets and, and you know, boxes and, and ladders um, really allows that type of interaction um, that you really can't do with, with current systems. Um, and that's why we end up having a huge amount of AI actually on the robot. You know, and the great thing is also once you give one robot an instruction, that then sets it up so that all robots in, in the, the fleet, as we call it, all robots working in that facility have all the same information. It's quite something to watch. I mean, it looks like you've got so many challenges to overcome. Systems integration for human robot teamwork is a whole new area of study. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a few surprising things that you had to build in. Oh, um, so this will build a little bit on you know, some of the previous panelists that work like Henny, for example. A lot of what you need to build in is these facilities to um, understand what people are doing and use the cues that we do with each other um, you know, quite automatically. So things like um, in the last scene, you saw two people talking and because they're facing each other and they're not taking up the whole role, we know that it's a good idea for the robot to you know, smoothly drive around them. And you know, the human equivalent of, excuse me, pardon me, need to get through here. <laughs> Um, if, for example, it was a larger group of people and they weren't facing each other, the robot would actually turn around and chose in a different aisle. So there's diff you, you, we actually use um, expectations about what people are doing and their behavior um, to, uh, d to change the, the behavior of the robot. And you know, that's just one example, but there's an entire field um, now of you know, what we call collaborative productivity, which is meshing human behavior and making it feel uh, natural and normal with robot behavior so that those two things mesh in a way that means that people's day-to-day -day experience around these machines is, is a positive one and not a negative one. That's absolutely fascinating. It's almost like you're teaching the robot the sort of local culture and I suspect the behaviours might change alongside the geography where the robot is being placed. And my goodness, this is very interesting. Thank you. Before we head to our next panellist, I'd just like to ask you where you think the industry is headed. Do you think we're going towards bespoke and tailor-made or one size fits all? Or just a little chat about where you think the next few years will see what you're doing? Yeah, I think um, I think it's a combination. I think there are certainly there are certainly um, many companies that are, are 
um, going down more of the one size fits all strategy. We call it, um, you know, we, we're starting in logistics, so we refer to that as the eat the warehouse strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, more and more um, people are waking up to and appreciating the idea of uh, collaborative robotics. And, um, you know, in, in from by my measure, there's actually more applications of collaborative robotics than there is of pure autonomy. So I actually see collaboration being something that continues to grow over time um, and to be something that we consider a uh, staple, you know, 10, 20 years from now and, and hopefully into the foreseeable future. You know, I think where this should go is um, people should think in, at a high level about what they want done and the policies that they want done around that. Um, and then these systems need to break that down into the, the minutia of how it gets done and do as much of that um, autonomous you know, with, with robots as possible, but following the direction and policy that uh, people outline. Because robots and AI systems will never have the context that we have as humans. And I think it's a mistake to, um, to try and replace that. So I think that you know, there's a beautiful balance of us remaining, you know, keeping the context and setting policy and um, making it feel natural for these uh, AI systems to fill in the rest. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Anthony. Wow. As ever, some excellent insights there into the ways how our robots will interact with us. And we're going to widen our perspective even further as Anthony turns off his camera and we have our new guests turn on theirs. And we're going to look at how robots are going to be accepted into society, what we can do to maintain robots for good in the broader world. And we've got the professor in the computer science department, the University of Southern California. It's Maya Matarich. Hello there. <laughs> Hello. Well, I would like to, uh, of course, violently agree, agree with everything that's been said, but I don't think that the broader world actually sees what we're striving for um, in this discussion. And so I just want to reiterate, because it really bears repeating and spreading the word, and that is that we need more balance. So right now, if you look at what's going on in AI and robotics broadly, um, most of the work by most of the people with most of the money is toward automation. Automation by definition is replacement. It's replacement of people with more efficient and cheaper systems that don't involve people. Um, and so when we think back at how AI and robotics in particular started, the idea of robotics was that we augment human ability, that we enhance it. And so I want to, again, kind of capture this tension that we have currently of the lack of balance with automation and augmentation. So if there's one thing you remember from the next 10 minutes, it should be that we need more augmentation. We need to think of ways in which AI broadly and robotics in particular can be useful and lucrative because there's always the profit motive. So it needs to be lucrative by not just taking our work away. Um, why? Because it's not just about the future of work. It really is about human purpose. People who don't have something to do to give them a sense of purpose. Um, have very unhappy and shorter lives. So what can we do about that? Well, I want to tell you about a specific field that we started um, now almost 20 years ago. So it's, I would say it's 18 years old, and that's the field of socially assistive robotics. And these robots um, exist to help people help themselves. So these robots don't do any physical work at all. They help people do their own work completely on their own, just through the robot's social support. So it's a very interesting and it was a surprising notion to people when the field started. But now, you know, it's out there and you could do everything from get funding for it to uh, do a startup in it. So, but we need a lot more of both. So basically the focus of socially assistive robotics is the idea that while we can have machines and AI monitor and coach what we do, we have seen that that's just simply not enough. So you can wear all, all kinds of sensors on your body. It still doesn't make you do the right thing. Um, it doesn't really help you eat healthier and uh, have that amazing, super healthy life and exercise after stroke and learn social gaze if you're a child on the autism spectrum and so on. And yes, there are numerous apps that will coach you and there is a general uh, recognition that those don't actually change behavior on a large scale. So what we need as humans is uh, someone to help us keep the motivation going, to give us that social support and companionship to do all the things that we need to do that are hard in life. And the pandemic was an, an incredible um, 
a wake up call for that because people became more distant from one another, not just physically, but also emotionally. And you see the results, incredibly vast rates of anxiety, depression, and worsening of every other condition. So the idea of socially assistive, socially assistive robotics is to empower people to do better and be better. And so let's talk about some examples that my lab has worked on that I hope will be inspiring. But in particular, just to tell you what's happened over the last 18 years, I'm very happy to say a lot has happened over the last 18 years. So when we started out, we had these studies short term, you know, and we did absolutely immediately venture out of the lab, which I think is a necessary first step of any good research. Get out of the lab um, to learn what's really needed who needs it and how to make it happen. And so we started out with really short-term deployments, you know, a couple of hours in a cardiac surgery, post-surgery rehab, um, a couple of hours at Children's Hospital. A decade into it, we were looking at multi-session interactions in schools, in retirement homes. And here we are now, um, and we're looking at, you know, having deployed robots for a month or longer in the homes of uh, children with autism, six months in nursing homes and so on. And it's really when you get in this regime of leaving robots in the real world, not in the lab, in the real world for months on end, that you're really testing robustness and system integration and collecting actually meaningful data in the real world and then really waking up to the hard problems. And there are plenty of hard problems, but that's what makes it worth it. So let me give you some wonderful examples of work that I think most people wouldn't even associate with robotics. So here's one. Um, we were very interested in how to use the embodiment of the robot, the fact that the robot has a body, in order to help without using that physical body to do physical work with infants. So I'm sure you know, little babies can be born with or can sustain an early injury that keeps them from developing properly. And when that happens, they can have and usually do have lifelong deficits. Um, so for example, something as simple as not moving their arms and doing motor babbling early on results in lifelong, uh, basically inability to move their arms properly. So we were interested in taking adorable babies. Um, you have to see, I mean, I have to say for me, that's the motivation. Yes, it is. So I just want to show you a baby interacting with the robot, and then I'll tell you why it's really important that this be a robot. And it can't be anything else. So the, the robot does something, and the baby, within a couple of minutes, is going to learn to imitate the robot. And therefore, the baby will end up doing the exercises that we want the baby to do. Because, let's think about this. I challenge you. How would you get a baby to do something that you want the baby to do? Well, parents can tell you right away that it can't be done. In fact, it can be done even with older children, but let's focus on babies. You can't tell babies what to do. They just do what they do and they don't understand what you're saying. Now you could show them, but when you are a, a big human and they're tiny humans, they also don't imitate. They imitate your facial expressions, but that's it. But if you put a baby-sized robot across from them, it's kind of like having another baby, a buddy. They will be triggered to imitate what that baby-sized robot does. Now you can ask me, why don't we put a baby across from a baby? And we should, absolutely, babies should play with one another. But you can't make a baby coach. Again, can't tell babies what to do. So in this very wonderful, elegant setup, um, my colleagues and I put together a, a setup in which basically the, the robot coaches the baby what to do and gets the baby to exercise. It's kind of like having your personalized coach very early in life. And we do see the babies look, they imitate, they exercise more, and that results then in better um, directed development for the baby. And now we're moving that work up and we're actually modeling interactions between babies and caregivers and understanding the effects of toxic stress that parents go through, which then result in really, really long-term effects in babies. For example, simple things like depression in the caregiver results in abnormal eye gaze in the baby, which then results in atypical development much longer in life. So these are things that we can help with. Another study that we did, well, actually a very long project that we did it, before the pandemic was looking at extremely large numbers of children who cannot be in school for various reasons, uh, whether because of autoimmune or physical disabilities or mental health issues, just so many kids missing school. Now, of course, everyone missed school during quarantine. Um, but before we go to that, we were just interested in seeing how can we embody a child in school through a physical robot? Why is that important? Why can't they just use its screen? Because they need the social interaction to have normal, typical growth. As we've seen during the pandemic, the lack of that social interaction has very profound 
impacts on development, cognition, uh, as well as emotional growth. And so we had this, you know, we we worked uh, with Omni Robotics, actually. They were very nice about an open API. And we put these robots in homes of children with serious physical and or uh, cognitive or social disabilities. And then we put them in schools. And this was amazing because it was a double robot deployment in the homes and in the schools. And we collected this unique data set with over 700 user comprehension cues. And we found these amazing vast differences across users. Imagine a boy who had not been in school for five years because he can basically only move his thumb, could now be in school. And sure, his body was just this simple robot, but it changed his life. He was happy. On the other hand, um, someone who could not be in school because of uh, social anxiety that was debilitating was very happy to be in school through this robot, but was very frustrated that this robot, after all, didn't have arms, couldn't really move its neck in a natural way, et cetera. So different users had different needs and different preferences. And robotics is just so, so far away from understanding how to personalize both the features and the behavior to different users. But isn't it a wonderful thing to study? Now, I want to uh, tease your mind with a new area that's emerging in robotics, a new frontier, and that is the intersection of uh, virtual augmented and mixed reality and robotics. It's called VAMHRI, and it gives us these completely new ways of interacting with users. So we are, for example, using simple tablets as AR, augmented reality interfaces, which then create a shared world for the robot and the user. Why is this important? because robots in the physical world still have very limited perception and limited abilities. Um, and so suddenly now we can have users see into the robot's mind. They can see thought bubbles. They can see where the robot sensors are. They can see where the robot plans to go. It kind of opens up the robot and it makes it less scary and unknown, which is very important in particular for young users and the elderly who are maybe not as you know at ease with some of these robots. And then we're using this to teach kids to code so we're having kids jump around and move objects while interacting with the robot coach. And that physical movement actually not only makes kids basically happier to be moving around, we've lost this in education. In education, everything is about sitting in front of a screen. And not surprisingly, there's a lack of motivation and retention. But when kids are moving around physically, they retain information better. In this case, they learn to code a lot faster and they experiment more. They try things. They're not afraid to fail. Why is it that when you move your body around, you're less afraid to fail? It's because that's how we're wired and robots help us do that. Another thing we're very interested in is increasing human empathy. I think we can all agree that there's been a reduction in empathy um, worldwide. There are many measures of it. Uh, we can debate about what the reasons are, but let's focus on what can we do about it. Now, interestingly, we can actually create robots that make people more empathetic. Now, we all know we can make robots that seem empathetic themselves. You know, a robot that says, oh, I'm so sorry, you're feeling sad. That's easy. Um, the harder part is what should the robot say and do to make you, the person, more empathetic? Because that's what we want. People who are more empathetic make a better world and they're themselves happier. So even if you're completely selfish, you should still be compassionate to others because it's good for you. And so we did a bunch of studies on robot empathy. We found some really interesting results, including what stories the robot should tell in order to make people feel empathetic, and also how, to, how robots should get help. Because you know, people bully robots because robots are just different enough from us. So people bully them. They bring out the worst behavior in a lot of people. And I think we need to remember that. This idea that everybody will be so excited to have robots in their world uh, not so clear. After all, was everybody excited about wearing masks? So it's an interesting question on how we create empathy for one another and for machines. And we're scaling that up now to uh, actually doing robot mediated support groups um, for mental health because of all of the huge soaring rates of anxiety and depression um, that have become more obvious after the pandemic. They were there before, they just got more obvious. Some of our most impactful work has been in autism. Autism is a great challenge that really pushes the state of the art in everything in AI and machine learning and robotics. And it's a great domain because if we can do good in autism, we can do it in every other realms, realm as well. It's just simpler. So I just want to show you a little bit of this video. This is on the web, easy to find. Meet Adrian, age six. This is some great work. And his robot friend, 
Kiwi. You are doing an amazing job. On this weekend morning, they've settled in to play some games, along with big brother Darren. Adrian is on the autism spectrum, and Kiwi is no toy. It's a socially assistive robot. You are doing really great. Keep up the good work. So I'll be happy to take questions later about why this is fundamental for development. Why having the robot and not just the screen makes all the difference um, in this little boy's development and his ability to learn social gaze and to learn to play with other children and to be able to immerse in the world around him with other people by having a robot peer. And then now, just to tell you where we're moving all of this in some new research directions, we're looking at developing a very, very low cost robot platform. And uh, we have gotten some funding for this. So there are going to be workshops to, to basically make this open source and available to everybody. So everybody can start to use these very simple robots. And then the application domains that we're really interested in are, as you would imagine, mental health. This is a massive worldwide pandemic. We talk about COVID, but the mental health pandemic is much larger uh, and much longer lasting. And so that's something that we'd like to do something about and try and help. So in summary, well-designed human-machine interaction can really make people better. It can improve our health. It can improve our ability to socialize with others. It can make us more empathetic and less selfish. Um, and it can and make us better at learning and training um, and doing things that we need to do. But only if people in AI and robotics work on real-world problems outside of the lab with real-world data, you know, the messy hard stuff. And my students do that, and I'm super grateful. So with that, I will end, and thank you. Wow, thanks Maya for an amazing jumping off point for our panel to get under the casing of the future of robotics for good. I'm going to invite our other speakers now to please turn on your audio and video and a note that interactivity is most certainly encouraged. And please audience, you're welcome to type in your questions. If anything has struck a chord or you'd like to know more, you really do have an impressive supply of experts just waiting to hear what your questions are. And whilst you get your questions in, of course, we've prepared some of our own already. I've got one to start with because I know, Henny, you were very excited talking, uh, seeing another panelist talk talking about collaboration over autonomy. So let's start with that. Tell us a little bit more about why that excites you. Yeah, uh, in, our, in our speaker chat, I mentioned to Anthony that I agree so strongly with his point about how collaboration is the way forward more than autonomy. I think um, it is tempting to try to remove the human entirely from the equation, for example, autonomous vehicles or autonomous factory robots. Um, and that will bring us to a point but at the end of the day, people are excellent decision makers. They are excellent reasoners. They have a depth of context and knowledge and experience that we're just not going to be able to put into a robot in any practical way um, or any gen general way. Um, and so if we can take advantage of the fact that we have these incredible experts available to us, we can actually get much further along in whatever we want to achieve than if we try to remove those experts and do it all just with them. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, let's just go over. We do have a question from our audience member already. Uh, one of them, Elizabeth Rochman asks, Dev, what are the current roadblocks that fully that would fully enable the use cases you've mentioned? So I think um, that she's talking about AI on the edge, swarm learning, what's stopping everything going to plan there? I think it's already in motion. Nothing is stopping. So, yeah, so... When we talk about robotics and all of this, all these ideas have been, robots have been around for decades, but now the proliferation of robotics is real is because this technology is there. Technology like 5G and others that come in when we talk about federated learning, when we talk about collaboration, you need the technology. And I think we are living in the right moment where all of these things have evolved to be ready for prime time. So I think it's more about the challenges of the thought process when people built robots before they were trying to think about taking anything custom or, or not custom generic purpose processors that, that were good for the computers. But when you think about battery operated devices, you need technology. Now that you have technology like this powerful technology in your hand, this 
already is a good anecdote of what technology has come to and you're able to do a lot of things. So I think in my opinion, we are ready and we are already in motion of doing all of that. And thank you very much. I'm going to come to you now, Anthony. Some AI capabilities that you're most hopeful about relative to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Are there any that you think will really help? Yeah, so I think um, the things that I, I'm most excited about really have to do with the ability for robots to perceive their environment. And it's building on technology like Dev has been describing. Um, and I'll, I'll start off by saying, I think we're, we're simultaneously further ahead than most people know and further behind than most people know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think the concern, for example, that robots are anywhere close to taking everyone's job anytime soon are completely overblown. Um, but on the other hand, I do think we're starting to have these kind of magical capabilities um, you know, of robots actually being able to be in a world where you know, if they're in the room with you, LJ, you know, they would know there's a person, there's a chair, there's three keyboards, there's a computer, and be able to actually make decisions based on that understanding. So it's really um, that level of perception that I think people may assume is already there, which it isn't. Um, the fact that that's actually now starting to mature is, is fundamentally one of the things I'm most excited about because it, it enables um, really all these interactions um, that we imagine um, you know, our robots having um, to make a positive experience. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, over to Maya now, I've got a good one. How do you balance between automation and augmentation? I guess this is finding the sweet spot between having a robot do everything for you and having a robot help you. And looking at your research, I suspect this answer will be quite a good one. <laughs> Well, and actually in our research, uh, we don't try to do any automation at all. So we really are there only to understand the needs of the user and help the user just kind of do it themselves. But what I really mean is that I think if we look at the field overall, what's happening is everyone's flocking to automation. Um, and that's a problem because if we have a good distribution of work, like if, if half of the people in robotics and AI were really focused on improving human ability, and not replacing it, then they would be okay on average. The problem is on average, there's no average, it's all on one side. But I, I think it's a really healthy thing to just keep in mind is to really understand what people need. I think what happens in technology is we all get very excited. Oh, we could do something. Let's try and see if we can do it. And we don't really think about downstream consequences. It's very human to get excited and do things and not think ahead. You know, we have these big brains in the front. We're supposed to be thinking very hard, but you know, the frontal lobe for planning, but we don't actually plan. Our robots tend to plan more than we do. Um, and so we should think a little bit ahead. And I find that the easiest way to do that, really, truly, is just, you know, get out of the lab and talk to some real people. And then you see some real problems. And it's much more sobering than us deciding what the problems are worth thinking about. Kind of as a takeaway point, students often say, how do I know what to work on? And, and my answer is, wow, that's really easy. The hard part is to choose one thing. But there's a plethora of great things to work on. Just get out of the lab and talk to some humans and they'll tell you what they need. They need a lot of things. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, in, in terms of designing for humans, um, I think, Anthony, it would be brilliant to bring you in on this human-centered design approach and why it's important for AI and robotics. Uh, 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 thank you. Um, absolutely. So one of the reasons that we take the perspective we do, what we call the human-centered design perspective is um, it's easy to make, well, it's easier to make something functionally good, um, but usually when you take that tack, it's, um, it can often be annoying for people to use. I think we've all, we've all used applications or, or devices that um, we wish we didn't have to interact with. Um, so human-centered design really fundamentally starts at looking at the needs of users and the interaction patterns around what people are trying to accomplish, and then designing a solution around that. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different devices that we use, everything from, um, you, know, what we, you know, diary studies where people spend time describing occasionally what they're doing, um, to you know, all the way up to things like focus sessions. But the idea is you're, you're constantly looking at human need and human behavior and designing your solution to match with that. You know, for me, it's an, you know, an honor to be on a panel with you know, Henry, Henry, 
Penny and, and, and Maya, because their research is really what kind of supports this type of work. Um, you know, so an example of something that was really interesting in our work, you know, we're designing a robot that's gonna be in factories. So we you know, uh, did a process where we engaged almost 200 people, you know, from managers to floor associates on, what are your favorite tools? What's the definition of a great day? What's the definition of a great shift? What do you need to get your job done better? And a lot of what we've designed is based on this overlap that we found between a bunch of things that make the business run better and make the people happier. And we're like, oh, build a tool that actually does both of those and then everyone wins. And that's really kind of uh, how we come at um, uh, solving these problems in a human-centered way. Brilliant, thank you very much. We have another question. Um, this one is for you, Henny. It's from Ahmed Al-Halali, who often works with people with visual impairments. Would a similar AI be possible to using voice commands instead of eye gaze in order to give access to difficult things like maybe even driving, things of the sort? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, there is work uh, at Carnegie Mellon, and actually just down the hall from me, um, that is, interested in building these kinds of assistive robots for people with visual impairment. Um, and so that's very much robotics research that is active right now. Um, I can tell you that some of that work um, looks at uh, building systems that can use our computer vision capabilities to help um, somebody with low vision recognize who is passing by them or what kind of facial expression they're making for social contact. Um, also can help them do navigation uh, in terms of finding direction in uh, large public transit spaces like uh, airports or train stations. So if you're interested in that, um, Aaron Steinfeld and Chaiko Asakawa are the two researchers that I would pursue in low, blind and low vision assistive robotics. Um, I did just want to jump on uh, what Anthony was saying. Anthony, what were you saying? Oh, about human-centered design. Um, every time we leave the lab to talk to our users, or every time we put a robot in front of real people, we are surprised by which of our assumptions get violated. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll pick on myself. One, I had this really brilliant project about developing robots for cooking assistance. Can we make robots that chop food and, you know, heat up meals and things like that? And I went to a conference of restaurateurs and chefs and they said, cooking is the fun part. Like, why would you take cooking away from us? We want robots that disinfect the equipment and that wipe down the table. Um, and so it was, it was really interesting to hear their actual needs and to, to recognize that our assumptions were not that correct. Yes, I think cooking is absolutely the fun part. If I could have a machine wash up for me a slightly more efficient way than a dishwasher, I would be very happy about that indeed. Um, let's go over to you, Dev, now, please, because we've just touched on what businesses want. And I think it's now a great time to ask how to ensure robotic development for good when typically business wants to drive efficiency and productivity, which may not always be the best for the people. Well, if I understand that right, <clears throat> yeah, um, it's about a combination of things, right? First of all, it's about motivating everybody to be involved. And how does that involve? So businesses, utility companies, and all of this need solution, but they have their business priorities. Robots are means to an end for them. For example, public service uh, or police departments wants to use drone, not because they love drones. They want the insight that comes from the drone. Uh, they want the video feed, situational awareness. Drone or a robot is means to the end. Keeping that in mind, keeping the business objective in mind, but at the same time, being able to give the solution which is seamless and, they, and then it does not need to, that's where autonomy and collaboration comes in uh, a fine balance, right? Where you cannot expect people to, okay, now have robots, but now have a, uh, uh, cumbersome task of being to, able to operate them while they are doing their real jobs and taking efficiency away. But things like in factories, robots have to aid workers not become another work for the worker to work uh, 
on the robot or make the robot work, right? So autonomy and collaboration is what is going to be important in keeping business objectives. But what we think about it is everybody being involved, an ecosystem being developed, putting development kits in people's hand who build application. The example of this is when, when we build the phone or when we build the technology for phone, we didn't think of the use cases that would enable. Now, Uber has an app using your phone calls the car here. They're having a business objective, but they're not building the phone. So we have to think about things that we cannot know what they're going to be enabled, but we have to put technology out there that will enable the future. So I don't know if that touches on the answer, but yes. That's really interesting. Thank you. Anthony, I'm, please add to that. Sure. Um, I think uh, one of the things that um, I think people often forget when they think about machines doing everything is you know, on the whole, the ecosystem, sorry, the, uh, the economy is a system. It, it's not a single thing. And that system actually functions by people and businesses actually um, buying goods and services. So, you know, if you take it to it's crazy um, and if robots did everything, there would actually be no economy because there'd be no people and businesses spending money on things because, you know, we wouldn't be actually getting any value or, or you know, pulling out any value. So I think once you, you look at that and you step back a little bit, it becomes clear that focusing just on autonomy is really only short, valuable in the short term for businesses. You know, there are certainly things that we need to automate, but the whole point of a business is to build goods or provide services that people pay for. Um, and if we automate everything out, then people aren't going to be actually paying for anything anymore. So I, I actually think there's a, a mid and long-term view on this, which is by building something that functionally does what people want and experientially does what people need, um, you know, so that, for example, they have good jobs, they have a positive interaction. They learn while do, you know, while cooperating with this thing that helps them in their job. You actually end up building more value. And you know, that ends up um, accruing more value to the companies that do that rather than the companies that are you know, kind of racing to the bottom to try and replace little, little functions uh, one after the other. So. Yes, it's a great point. If we can encourage businesses to see that if you look after the whole person, that's probably ultimately going to turn out a lot more profitable than otherwise. Okay, well, my goodness, we're going to come to the wrap soon, but I can fit one more audience question in before I ask each of you about your futures. And that's from Chow and Gwyn. And uh, the question is about AI ethics. Um, I think what we want to do really is just have a quick overview of the concerns around AI ethics and, and robotics, I guess. But uh, there's, it's such a massive subject. And Henny, I think you're going to be hard pressed to give us an answer in the, the short time we have. But I know you'll do your best. I'll give you. Yeah, I'll give the brief answer. Um, AI ethics is absolutely critical to be considering as we develop systems that are working with people. Um, there are a number of axes along which we think about the ethics of robotics. There's the privacy access, access, you know, who gets access to data, how does that data get used? There's the um, uh, morality access, especially when you're talking about robots that are working with uh, maybe older adults with cognitive impairments or even pe younger people with cognitive impairments where the robot is trying to make their life better, but is doing so in a way that might um, raise ethical concerns about deception, for example. Um, there's the jobs, right? The the robots taking taking over people's jobs, which I think Anthony is right, is not going to happen in a large scale anytime soon. But is definitely, I mean, technology is taking over jobs all the time. Um, so I think that all of these are important. Um, and what I've learned by being in the field is that there is not a right answer. Um, that it's really important that we keep discussing it. It's really important that organizations like the UN um, and the EU and the US government are having conversations and legislating the general policies and that as robot creators, we are also very, very aware of the kinds of impact that our technologies can produce in the world. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much for stepping up and attempting to answer the beginnings of an incredible question. And like all of these panels, it feels like we're opening a conversation. We don't have the answers and audience. We really like it when you get involved. So I'm going to wrap the panel up by asking the same question to each panelist. It's more of a multiple choice, really. What one thing would you like to change or get help with? Because we have a very influential and interesting audience here. And what challenge are you most proud of meeting? And you can answer one or both of these questions. So I'm going to start with you, Dev, what would you like help with or what would you change and or what challenge are you most proud of meeting? No, so I think we are very proud of meeting the technology needs. I mean, there are so many good ideas, everything, right, to be able to provide robots to young children, to be able to uh, provide robots that are uh, aiding humanity in different use cases, to be able to provide technology that can enable a, a flight that happens on Mars in a different atmosphere. The, all what is needed is technology behind that. So we're so proud that we can bring that technology. And when it comes to robotics, why I'm specifically proud be, uh, to be part of Qualcomm is there's no other, uh, or there's not enough robotics business in incentives to create something specific for robotics. Nobody's building a chip for robots, but at least, and that's changing, by the way, because this all of this coming together. But the phone chips or the chips that are used for computing on mobile devices have become so uh, conducive to these use cases because you need cameras, you need CPUs, you need AI processing engine, you need all of that. We are putting this, and the proud part of it is putting this in an energy in a thermal envelope that actually aids the sustainability goals, right? You're not, you mentioned earlier, cooking is fun. But cooking eggs with your robot because it's overheating is not fun, right? Uh, that's, that's what we are proud about. One thing that I would want to see things change is the perspective because robots have been a hobbyist community for, as it evolved, then it's changed to you uh, being more enterprise driven than others. But when people thought about robots, they thought about cobbling things together, right? Taking up general purpose CPU or general purpose GPU and things like power, energy efficiencies become afterthought. Things like security, one bad thing that happens to robot and that, that affects all of us because it, it gives a bad connotation for robotics. We are trying to do robotics for good, but one, one bad incident happened that takes over people's thought process and okay, this is not right, this is not that good. But nonetheless, being paying attention and putting some thought, like Maja mentioned, using the frontal quote is brain to think through what we want the end goal to be, why we want it to be good and plan for it is what I think should change. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. All right, let's try um, Anthony next. What one thing would you change or like help with and on what challenge are you proud of meeting? One or both answers, that's fine. Sure, so the thing, I think my answer interweaves all of them. So I think the, the, the challenge that I'm most proud of is um, really looking at things from a human-centered perspective. Um, I'm trying to find these win-wins where um, you both provide um, a large amount of you know, business or functional value at the same time as a large amount of human experience value. Um, and what that's opened up for us is we're, we, we now feel like we're designing for a, a very different um, type of device than has ever existed. You know, so instead of um, you know, just designing for a robot that you know, picks something up and moves it to another location, you know, the, the challenge for us, um, the thing we need help with is um, figuring out this completely new design space. You know, what's, what does interaction with robots um, really need to feel like? What are some primitives that you can use? You know, and the analogy that I use is we all take for granted, um, you know, using computers and having things like windows and, you know, boxes that open and close a window or being able to grab it and drag it around. There's an entire um, language there and set of facilities that we now take for granted. What's the equivalent of that for 
machines that we share space with in the world. You know, it's a huge problem because you go from you know two D you know in computers and tablets to three D out in the real world, and we have all of these priors for how we behave in that three D world. Um, but there's a giant interaction space that you know, I'm kind of inviting anyone who wants to work on this work to be a part of, because it's it's a massive challenge. But I think it's really the challenge for the next couple of decades for us, because I think it will help define um, how we interact with these machines. And I think that that will uh, have a huge positive uh, experience on us day to day as our interaction with these machines becomes more and more prevalent. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Anthony. Um, Henny, next question to you. What would you like to change or get help with or what challenge are you proud of meeting? Yeah, I am sort of building on Anthony's point here, uh, the human centered design point, which is that um, I, at the end of the day, every robotics problem is a human robot interaction problem because we're building robots for people. We're not building robots in isolation of human beings. Um, and so we do need to think about the human, even in, in robotics challenges that seem like they don't involve people like automation. Um, when we do that, I think our next challenge in that space is to think about diversity. Um, because for a long time, we have built models of um, humans in our HRI systems in a particular kind of monolithic way. Um, and as I've been in the field, I've learned and come to realize that there is such a diversity of human ability and experience. Um, so one example from my own work is I talked about eye gaze um, and how we can use eye gaze to help predict goals. Somebody in the Q&A pointed out that some people are blind or low vision and aren't using their eye gaze in that way, which is perfectly valid. There are other people um, who don't use eye gaze in sort of neurotypical ways, especially in social interaction. Um, and so we want to be able to account for the richness and diversity of all the different um, kinds of behaviors that people are exhibiting and the kinds of needs that people have when it comes to robots. Um, and I think that's going to be a big challenge as we move forward. Yes, it's a big responsibility that we all have a tiny part of to try and, and widen out this sort of research. So thank you for that. And then finally, Maya, we've come to you to ask this question. I'm really impressed that we've not mentioned Asimov's laws yet here when it comes to human and robot interaction. There's still a chance as we go to you to ask, what would you like to change or get help with? Or what would you like to talk about that you're proud of doing? Ah, no chance at all to talk about Asimov's laws, although I do find that old science fiction quite inspiring. Um, so I am going to say something ideally controversial. Um, I want people with money to stop being so incredibly boring. They are so boring. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this thing that's going to maximize this profit. And it's so boring. Come on, be interesting. Tackle something that actually is hard. So, you know, pick a population with special needs and try and help them. Oh, wow, that's hard. Will it make you enough money? Oh, I'm so sorry. You don't have enough. Oh, and by the way, we totally know that having a lot of money does not make people happy. So what do you want? You want to be happy? Go help someone. So I am so tired of boring rich people. So that's my main thing. My main challenge is we need more investment, significantly more investment in human-centered technologies that cuts across AI and robotics and wearables and haptics. And it just, it's its this massive, and for that matter now going into the metaverse, like what is it for? Are we just gonna play games? Really people? And then you look outside and you see what's gonna be a bunch of pitch pitchforks of people being profoundly unhappy and, and under-resourced. So yes, diversity is a part of the answer. And the thing that I'm most proud of is the amount of uptake we've had for this field. Like I see so many young people going into it. A large percentage of them is all about the money. Those are people who end up being very unhappy in about five years. They get that dream job and then they're wondering, why am I not happy? Because guess what? You have no idea what you want to do with your life. It's so much easier and making money is not a goal. So it's not a goal that makes people happy. I'm sorry. It just isn't. So my controversial point is read some literature on happiness and joy and what make peace, makes people live longer and find a purpose in life. And when you look around, the best purpose is doing something that helps people. It's so satisfying. And so I am so happy with the this young generation. It, it just sees farther. It has that bigger, bigger frontal lobe. And you know what? They're all depressed. Why are they depressed? Because the older fogies, all of us included, are failing to do what they need. So I say, come on, old fogies, do something that all the young people are calling for. Let's do something interesting. Let's do something hard. 
let's do something good. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you so much to all the panelists and the audience. We really appreciate your time and attention and we'll shortly see you all on the neural network where you'll get the opportunity to interact with an AI matched participant for the next few minutes. Thank you so very much panelists and we'll see you in virtual and it's time for me to hand over to Gilem to close the session. So uh, thank you all so much, LJ, and a big thanks to our speakers, Maya, Henny, Anthony, and Deb, as well as to all the participants for making it such an interesting discussion. We had lots of great questions and an amazing insight into how robots can augment our human potential to advance the sustainable development goals. We encourage you to check out the AI for Good program online to see more robotic sessions that may be of interest to you. For example, in two weeks, we are having a session on intelligent robots for space science and planetary exploration. And on Thursday, the 13th of October, we'll have a session on drones for disaster risk reduction. We are very much looking forward to engaging with you in our upcoming events. This is the end of this section and the start of the networking in the AI for Good Neural Network with the panelists and participants for the next 15 minutes. See you all in a couple of minutes. And now I would like to give the floor back to Anna for the closing information. Thanks a lot. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good.